It's, it's kind of a miracle that I'm, I'm here to give you a uh, talk today. Uh, I am, uh, I'm a wanted man in Russia. Um, just to, I'll, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you the story of why, uh, why it's so strange or, or um, uh, unusual that I'm here today, and then I'll give you a, a bit more background about the whole Magnitsky story. Um, uh, Sergei Magnitsky, the, the, the title of this, of this speech was, was my lawyer, um, who was murdered um, in Russian police custody three and a half years ago. And I've been involved in a campaign to get justice for him ever since, which uh, culminated, culminated in a big success in America in December with something called the, the um, Magnitsky Act passed, which imposes visa sanctions and asset freezes on the people who killed him, as well as people who who uh, perpetrate other gross human rights abuses in Russia. The Russian government wasn't happy. And um, shortly after the Magnitsky Act was passed, um, they, did, um, they organized a, um, uh, an arrest warrant for me. Um, they applied to Interpol to um, put out an all points bulletin for me um, about a month ago. And so when, with, an Interpol, with a Russian arrest warrant and an Interpol all-points bulletin, um, we felt like it was important to um, get some guarantees from Germany that I, if I came here, I wouldn't be arrested. And so um, I put in a very detailed letter to the um, uh, German authorities asking for a guarantee that I wouldn't be arrested. Um, and remarkably, um, we got back a response saying, um, we can't give you that guarantee. This was not, doesn't, it, this came from the sort of mid-level bureaucracy in, inside the um, German government. And um, the, our um, uh, hosts didn't want to take the responsibility to have, of me being arrested and then sent back to my death in Russia. So they said, they, they, they said well, I think it's probably best if we just cancel the event. And, um, uh, and so we, um, we announced that the event was canceled because the German government wouldn't guarantee my safety coming here which led to a firestorm of, of questions from the press and from politicians as to why the German government wouldn't give a, a guarantee of safety to a justice campaigner. And about 24 hours later, the German justice minister um, intervened and did exactly what, 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 a, what Germany should do, which was guaranteeing my safe passage in a very explicit um, uh, and literal way. Um, and then a day later, on Friday, um, Interpol intervened as well and um, uh, put, a, put a big um, announcement on their website saying that they've rejected Russia's request for an all-points bulletin. So um, now I felt safe coming here and our um, sponsors um, uh, reinstated the event and so here we are um, today. Um, and, um, and, and as you can see, th this is um, high politics we're playing um, with this whole issue, and it's something that the Russian government cares very deeply about. And, and one could argue that I'm probably um, the single most despised uh, foreigner of Vladimir Putin. And so what I'd like to do um, very briefly today is tell you the story of how this guy with an American accent um, became the most despised foreigner in Russia, because I think it sets the stage very well for my two esteemed colleagues um, to um, get into the policy implications of this um, um, of this story for um, a, a, the wider purpose. Um, <clears throat> so indeed, I am from America. You can hear from my accent, but I'm from a very unusual um, background. My grandfather, um, who was also American, um, uh, was, was a labor union organizer from Wichita, Kansas, and um, he was good at it and in, um, in the 1920s. And he was so good at it, in fact, that the um, uh, Comintern, Communist International, <clears throat> which is the international wing of the Communist Party, said, if you like labor unionism, you're going to love communism, why don't you come to Russia? And so my grandma, uh, grandfather uh, moved to Moscow in 1927, met my grandmother um, uh, there. My father was born in Moscow. And five years later, he returned to America to become the general secretary of the American Communist Party for the next 13 years. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm not a communist, as you probably can tell by the way I look and, and my, the, the introduction. <laughs> um, and what happened was, in my teenage years, I, I uh, uh, went through my teenage rebellion and 
if you're a teenager from, and you're going through your teenage rebellion from a family of communists, what's the best way to rebel? I, I put on a suit and tie and became a capitalist. <laughs> and that really did work. My family was not happy. I went on to um, uh, Stanford Business School, and I graduated in 1989, which was the year that the Berlin Wall came down. And I had this um, great vision, which was that my grandfather was the biggest communist in America. I'm going to become the biggest capitalist in Eastern Europe. And that's what I set out to do. And I moved to London at the time because there was nothing that I could do in Eastern Europe. And eventually, um, the Russian government um, decided to privatize all of their state-owned companies. And it created um, uh, a big opportunity for 22 oligarchs um, who um, basically took away half of the Russian state. But it also created a small opportunity for people um, like me. And I set up an investment fund um, in 1996 called the Hermitage Fund. And I moved to Moscow to invest in shares of Russian companies. And my investment fund started with almost nothing. And then it, it, it grew to become, as I had, had, had aspired, to become the largest investment fund in Russia with more than uh, $4 billion invested in the Russian stock market. And it was a big success, and it was very exciting and, and gratifying as a businessman. But one of the things I discovered as I was investing was that the companies that I was buying shares of, Gazprom, the National Savings Bank, the National Electricity Company, were essentially, um, uh, the companies were being robbed blind by the um, managements of these, by the management teams. And, and in some cases, the oligarchs who own these companies. And, uh, and it, was, it was both morally repulsive to see this going on in such a brazen way, and it was also financially disadvantageous to own shares of companies where the profits were all being stolen. And so I decided to try to do something about it. But it was very difficult to do something about it in Russia because um, there was no police force that policed such things. And, um, and it was just generally accepted that, that um, uh, it was OK for, for this type of grand theft to be occurring. And so I, I said to myself, what tools do I have that I can actually do something about this? Um, and really, the only tools that I had was, was a, a very smart team of young um, Russian employees who could research how the stealing was taking place, and then being able to share that research with the press. And um, we put together what we called name and shame campaigns against companies like Gazprom and these other big state-owned companies, and um, where we would find out who did the stealing, how they did it, where the money was, and, um, and then exposing it through the Financial Times, the Wall Street Journal, and various other publications. And these um, uh, publications published this, this information. And remarkably, it, it had a big effect in Russia. And, um, uh, and many, many hundreds, if not thousands, of articles were written about these campaigns. And in the end, um, it, it had, had a number of effects, um, both positive and negative. The, the positive effect was that when you expose massive corruption, um, uh, it's kind of hard to carry on doing it. And as a result, some of the corruption stopped. Um, the share prices went up. And we felt pretty good about ourselves. The negative um, was that the people who, were, who we were stopping from stealing um, ended up um, getting very angry. And um, they got so angry that in November 13th, 2005, as I was returning to Moscow from London, where I'd been for the weekend, I was stopped at Sheremetyevo 2 airport. I was detained and taken to the um, detention center of the airport, stayed there for 15 hours, and then eventually put on an airplane back to London and declared a threat to national security, never to be allowed back into Russia again. Um, at the time, I understood that when Russia um, turns on you, they don't do it in a half-hearted way. And um, this was not going to be the end of my problems. This was going to be the beginning of my problems. And so I did two things to try to protect myself. Um, I liquidated all of our holdings in Russia as quickly and as quietly as I could so that we didn't, didn't have assets that could be seized like they did to Michael Hordakovsky of Yukos. Um, and the second thing I did was I um, uh, evacuated my staff. And I figured with no money and no people, um, there's nothing, nothing really more they could do. And, and that was what I thought was 
was um, the end of the story. It turned out that it wasn't the end of the story at all. It was the beginning of what will turn out to be one of the worst nightmares that anyone could ever experience in any country anywhere in the world. Um, about 18 months later, on June 4th, um, 2007, 25 police officers raided my office in Moscow, and 25 more officers raided the office of my law firm, an American law firm that I used to do all of our legal work. And they were specifically looking for the stamps and seals and certificates of the investment holding companies through which we had invested all this money, not knowing that the companies were empty. They got hold of these stamps and seals and certificates, and the next thing we learned was that we no longer owned our investment holding companies. Using those documents seized by the police, um, they had been fraudulently re-registered out of our name into the name of a man who had been convicted of murder and let out of jail early by the Interior Ministry, presumably to put his own name on these documents. <clears throat> we were um, amazed and shocked by this whole incident, and so we um, went out and hired a team of lawyers. We hired seven lawyers from four different law firms, and one of those lawyers was a young man named Sergei Magnitsky. He was a 36-year-old lawyer who worked for an American law firm called Firestone Duncan. And um, Sergei was one of the most vigilant and smartest lawyers I had met in my time in Russia. And um, we put him to work on investigating exactly what this whole s situation was about. Um, in the interest of time, I won't, I won't share with you the, the entire findings of his, but the culmination of his work, um, which was that after about nine months of investigation, he learned that the um, theft of our companies had two objectives. One was to steal all of our assets, but thankfully we didn't have any money left in Russia, so they didn't succeed in that. But the second objective was to steal $230 million of taxes that we paid to the Russian government in the previous year as, as capital gains tax when we were leaving the country. And that they succeeded in doing. Using doc our, our documents, police, tax officials, and organized criminals in a complex fraud stole $230 million, not from us, but from the Russian government itself. And we were amazed when Sergei came up with this, this finding because um, we figured that it may have been one thing to steal from foreigners, and that was probably approved at the highest level, but to steal from, from the country itself by officials, we thought that couldn't possibly have been approved. You know, Putin was talking tough about cracking down on tax evaders and put Michael Hordakovsky in jail for supposed tax evasion, and all of a sudden, $230 million is going missing from the government. We figure that must be a rogue operation. And if it was a rogue operation, we figured, let's just um, expose it. Let's, like we did all these other campaigns, let's expose it and see, um, see if the good guys will get the bad guys, and that, that's the end of the story. And so we wrote nine different criminal complaints to every branch of the Russian law enforcement system. And then I went on to Echo Moscow Radio and to Vedomosti newspaper, the main business newspaper. And we expected that shortly thereafter there would be SWAT teams and helicopters going after the people who did this. Well, there were SWAT teams and helicopters, but they didn't go after the people who did this. They went after all seven of our lawyers from four different law firms. Turned out there were no um, good guys in the Russian authorities, just bad guys. And um, I, I was amazed that they, are, um, they, would, and they, they opened criminal cases against all of our lawyers. And I didn't want my lawyers getting into trouble, and so I asked them all to leave Russia at my expense and come to London until the storm passed. It wasn't a p particularly pleasant proposition for anybody because I was asking people well-established in their own careers some of them didn't speak a word of English to come to a foreign country where they didn't have skills and stay there for an indefinite period of time. But um, six of my seven lawyers ultimately accepted my invitation. The one who didn't was Sergei Magnitsky. Sergei said, no, I've not broken any laws. They can't arrest me because I have not done anything wrong. And he said, moreover, the people who are doing this have stolen a huge amount of money from my country and they should be punished. And so Sergei stayed, and Sergei ultimately testified against the police officers who conducted the raid and the criminals who carried out the crime. He testified on the um, 14th of October, 2008, 
And um, roughly a month later, on the 24th of November, two subordinates of one of the officers he testified against came to his home at 8 in the morning in front of his wife and two children, arrested him, put him in pretrial detention, and then began to torture him to get him to withdraw his testimony. They put him in cells with 14 inmates and eight beds and left the lights on 24 hours a day to impose sleep deprivation. They put him in cells with no heat and no window panes in December in Moscow, so he nearly, nearly froze to death. They put him in cells with no toilet, just a hole in the floor where the sewage would bubble up onto the floor. They would regularly forget to feed him for up to 36 hours and various other things. They were doing this in order for him to withdraw his testimony against the police officers and to sign a false confession to say that he stole the $230 million that he exposed and reported. And he did it at my instruction. And Sergei, no matter how much pain he was suffering from all of this unpleasantness, refused to perjure himself and refused to give false, false testimony. About six months after his initial arrest, all of this torture began to, <clears throat> began to grind him down, and his health deteriorated. He lost 20 kilos, developed very severe pains in his stomach, and was diagnosed as having pancreatitis and gallstones, and needing an operation. His operation was scheduled for the 1st of August, 2009. One week before his operation was due, the um, authorities and the people in charge of his investigation from the Interior Ministry made an abrupt decision to move him from prison that had medical facilities to a maximum security prison called Butyrka, which is considered to be one of the toughest in Russia, and most significantly for Sergei, it's a prison that had no medical facilities. They move him to Butyrka, and at which point his health completely breaks down and it goes into a downward spiral. He goes into constant agonizing pain, and they refuse him medical attention. He applied in writing on 20 different occasions to every different branch of the interior ministry, of the, of the um, judicial system, um, <clears throat> and of the penal system to get medical attention. And every one of his requests was either ignored and some were rejected in writing. And on the night of November 16, 2009, Sergei Magnitsky goes into critical condition. Only then do they agree to move him to a prison that has a hospital and they move him back to the prison that has a hospital. But when he, when he arrives there, instead of putting him in the emergency room, they put him in an isolation cell, and eight riot guards with rubber batons beat him for one hour and 18 minutes until he died at the age of 37. That was November 16, 2009. How do we know all this? We know this because Sergei Magnitsky wrote it all down. He wrote it all, da all down in the form of 450 criminal complaints about his mistreatment in custody that he filed during the 358 days he was detained. And so we have a granular day-by-day -day record of how he was being abused, who was abusing him, where they're abusing him, when they're abusing him, and what their reasons for abusing him were. And as a result of this, we have the, what I would describe as the modern-day Gulag Archipelago of Russia. And because of this information, and because of information that we've been able to gather since then, th there is no uncertainty about what happened to Sergei Magnitsky. This is not, th th there is no plausible deniability. This is a, a, an, a, probably the most, th this is, is the most well-documented case of human rights abuse that's come out of Russia. And we expected, because it's well-documented, that the people who committed this abuse would be prosecuted. And we expected it because it was publicized and it was out there for everybody to see. But instead of, of prosecuting the people who killed Sergei Magnitsky, they covered up the whole crime. The Interior Ministry said he died of natural causes. He died of a heart attack. The Interior Ministry said that the people um, who were responsible for his arrest and his detention did nothing wrong. They gave those people promotions and, in some cases, special honors. And then to top it all off, um, a, a few months ago, they decided to put Sergei Magnitsky himself, along with me, on trial. This will be the first trial in Russia, in the history of Russia, in which a dead man is standing trial. Well, it, it became clear to us that the Russian authorities 
we're going to cover up everything, and there was no way we're going to get justice in Russia. So we said to ourselves, we can't get justice inside of Russia. Let's look for justice outside of Russia. Well, how do we get justice outside of Russia? For the most part, murder in a Russian prison doesn't have jurisdiction in Germany or the United Kingdom or America. Therefore, we had to find something else. Well, the one thing that, that, that's obvious about this crime and obvious about a lot of crimes these days in the Russian regime is that this was a crime of money. This wasn't a crime of ideology or religion or ethnicity. This was a crime to steal $230 million. And the one thing we know about people who steal this money in Russia is as easy as it was to steal this money from the state, <clears throat> it's that easy that that money will get stolen from these people if they keep it in Russia. And so what do they do? They keep their money outside of Russia. They keep it in Swiss banks, and German banks, and British banks, and American banks. They travel abroad. They keep their children abroad. They send their kids to boarding school abroad. They shop abroad. And the one thing that we have an absolute ability to, to do is to stop their ability to travel and to use the Western banking system. And so we came up with an idea of imposing visa sanctions and asset freezes on the people who killed Sergei Magnitsky. We started in the United States, and it caught on like wildfire. It seemed like a really a, a, an idea whose time has come. And as a result of, of the US Congress um, taking an interest in this whole story, um, we, we, we started something called the Magnitsky Act, which was um, uh, a piece of legislation which would impose visa sanctions and asset freezes on the people who killed Sergei. It was launched in October of 2010 by Senator Benjamin Cardin of Maryland and Senator John McCain of Arizona. And when it was launched, it lit up the Moscow sky because everybody in Russia knows that this is what these people care about. And I'm sure that um, Prime Minister Kasyanov will, will tell, tell us about the Russians' reaction to this. Um, it lit up the Moscow sky because everybody understands that this is, we, this is the Achilles heel of the people who do these types of things. And as a result of that, other victims started coming forward to Senator Cardin and Senator McCain. And they said, my father, my brother, my son, my wife was tortured and murdered in a similar way. And so after a number of these approaches, they decided to do something which, which, changed, which I believe will change the history of, of human rights advocacy around the world, which was they said, instead of making this just a law for Sergei Magnitsky, let's make this a law for all other victims in Russia as well. They, they relaunched the law, adding about 25 words, adding, saying that all other victims of human rights abuses should be covered under the same law. And as a result of that, we ended up with, a, with an overwhelming majority of the um, Senate and House of Representatives supporting it. In December of last year, it was voted on in the Senate, 92 in favor, four against. It was voted on in the House uh, with an 89% majority. And Barack Obama signed it into law on the 12th of December last year. In Europe, we've been working on a similar initiative. And that's why Christina Oiland is here. Um, we, um, uh, in parallel, in the European Parliament, we've also put forth a European version of the Magnitsky Act. And in fact, if we look at the, the reality of the situation, the American law is, is hugely important and hugely symbolic, but 95% of the assets of corrupt Russian officials are not held in America, they're ha held in Europe. These people go on vacation to the south of France. You can see them here in Berlin, you can see them in London. And this is, this is really what they care about, is Europe. In the European Parliament, last November, um, Christina Oiland put forth a resolution um, calling on the European, the Council of Ministers, Council of Foreign Ministers of the European Union to impose visa sanctions and asset freezes in Europe. And the resolution was passed with an overwhelming majority in the European Parliament. However, to this day, the European Council of Ministers has not acted. They've not done anything. And since this is truly a, a, a piece of legislation which will change, change the way that Russians behave and change the way the human rights abuses are dealt with, um, it's become our top priority in the Magnitsky campaign to make this happen. 
And so uh, this is where I'm going to leave it to, to, the, um, to the politicians to, to discuss the, um, the story. But um, I, I hope I haven't taken too long, and, and thank you for your time.